In other words, we actually sign an agreement that says if you will stop more than 50 times a year, for number 51 onwards, we'll pay you money, not the other way around. Convenience is there. The cost of the electric car actually becomes cheaper because you don't buy the battery. Battery is no, is no longer a component of the car, it's actually a consumable. It's the ink in the inkjet, not the printer in the inkjet. And so the cost of an electric car becomes something in the range of about $20,000. Less components inside. As a matter of fact, in the drivetrain, there's about a third of the components, and none of them moves other than one, the motor. They're all electronics, and just like consumer electronic devices, they go cheaper and cheaper and cheaper every year. How much cheaper? These cars will go somewhere around $10,000 within about five years' time when they get to high volume. Cost, build material to make. I don't know what they'll charge you, but that will be the cost to make them. Then comes the third part. If we can make a cheaper car that has zero emission, doesn't need oil, and is more convenient, how much does it cost to drive? And we figured out, given that you'll be able to pay what petrol is, can we make the battery and the electrons cheaper than the cost of petrol? The cost of the battery plus the cost of electrons in 2011, 2012, will be about five US cents per kilometer. It's hard to remember what we pay for a kilometer, but let's multiply by what your car does per liter about 12 kilometers a liter. And so the cost of our virtual liter is about 60 cents. Anybody here knows where to find a 60 cent liter in the street? Our cost in 2015, again, because this is electronics and because batteries are on the curve that goes down by about 8 to 10% every year for the last 35 years, by 2015, the same combination. Battery plus clean electrons, only green renewable electrons, photovoltaics, wind, will be three, about two and a half US cents. And by 2020, about one and a half to two cents. Two cents, even if we got every car in Australia to be 20, mile, 20 kilometers per liter, would, be, would mean about 35, 40 cents per virtual liter in 2020. Anybody here thinks they'll be able to buy a 35, 40 cent liter in 2020? Odds are you're looking at a two and a half dollar liter at the petrol station at that point in time. In other words, we've created the first company that will distribute kilometers, also known as oil companies, at a cost of distribution similar to gas petrol stations with what looks like an 80 to 90 percent future margin in a market that already buys about three trillion dollars worth of kilometers worldwide. The biggest financial opportunity on Earth. It is so obscene that somebody will actually think they can make 80, 90 percent margin on kilometer that we've decided to be really good. We figured out by the time we make that margin, why don't we give back a bit to the consumers? So if you sign up for five, six, seven years, depending on the location, depending on the price, depending on whether oil will spike again to $150 a barrel as it did last summer, we're going to give you back yeah, maybe four, five, six cents a kilometer. Five cents a kilometer means the electric car is free. Every one of you has a device like that in your pocket. You sign up for three years, you get a phone. Remember that? It does not commoditize the phone. It actually allows us to create iPhones and Blackberries and Nokias and all these great devices. They still cost six, seven hundred dollars to the phone companies, but they subsidize it to you. Cross-subsidy is something that happened in every industry. By the way, when it does happen, it tips the industry. Anybody here bought another landline in the last 10 years? These shifts happen, and they happen so fast. You blink an eye, and the entire industry has changed. Why does it change? Because I guarantee you every one of you goes back home tonight and says, I'm not sure I'm buying another petrol car. Because if I do, I might be the last idiot who won't be able to sell it. <laughs> when we explain it to consumers, in Australia, 50% of them said, my next car will only be electric. Surveys done with people not selected by us. 
The tipping of this industry happens so fast, yet the industry is very slow. A car from design to release, for example, the Renault cars that we've worked with Renault very closely over the last two and a half years, the beginning of the project was the beginning of 07, the car will ship in middle of 11 in volume. Four years is the fastest process in this industry to get a car on the road. In other words, today's new project at Holden will ship in 2013 or 14. Our network will be out by 2012. If somebody, for example, will design another hybrid and try and sell it in 2014, it will be trying to sell a kid on the concept of a fax when they've been on email for two years. And then saying it's so much better than snail mail. It will be like shipping Hummers into a market today. These decisions have to happen way, way, way in advance. In a market that has a four-year delay from decision to product, you have to design the product by looking at a crystal ball, not at a rear view mirror. How big of an opportunity it is? The kilometers in this case are not made out of liquids that are dug out of 25,000 feet in the crust of this planet. They're made out of chemicals, natural resources that are mixed together to form kilometers in the form of an electric car battery. It just so happens that the top technology today in the market is a mix of lithium, iron, and phosphate. And it just so happened that the place where you can find lithium, iron, and phosphate is in this country. Now, Australia can choose to ship lithium, iron ore, and phosphates and buy kilometers or ship kilometers. The country that ships the most kilometers on this earth today is called Saudi Arabia. And in the next 15 years, every single car on the planet will go electric. And we need one billion battery packs. One billion battery packs. That's how big of an opportunity it is. The US put $2 billion into it. The Chinese just put more than $2 billion into it. The Japanese just put more than the Chinese. UK, Portugal just put money into it. The Koreans put money into it. Everybody's in the, in the race to own kilometers in the form of batteries. These decisions are being made right now. Right now, it's about a $2 billion catch-up game. In about two years' time, it'll be $20 billion catch-up game because the scientists will move to certain places. The manufacturing sites will move to certain places. Time changes the magnitude of investment to catch up. That's the opportunity that is in front of decision makers right now around the world. Now, this would have been a great story had I followed my path and wrote it on a piece of paper. I wrote 11 versions of white paper in 2005 and 2006. By 2006, the white paper was fantastic to the degree that I handed it out to car companies, oil companies. Most of them cheered when SAP decided that I'm no longer the CEO. Um, <laughs> but none of them took it seriously. It was an idea. I handed it out to governments. I won't identify the names of the government, but the reaction I usually got was, it's great that the young generation is thinking about these problems. <laughs> until I got to the only politician in the world that's actually younger than myself. I presented in a panel by a, a great Israeli guy who lives in LA called Chaim Saban. The Saban Forum meets every year in DC and Jerusalem. I got to present after Daniel Jurgen, the foremost uh, expert on oil, and I got to speak about how to run a country without oil. Three seats to my right set Shimon Peres. At 87, years of age, still the youngest politician on earth. He, halfway through my presentation, six minutes into it, he said, do you have anything written? I said, yeah, I have a white paper. And I handed it over in the middle of my presentation. He couldn't wait. He wanted to read it. So, and he read it, called me up after two days and said, this is real. This is, you, you thought about it. Come to my office.